Good morning and uh, welcome to the second meeting in 2022 of the Scottish Commission for Public Audit. Agenda item number one is decision on taking business in private. Uh, I seek agreement from members to take agenda item four in private. Are we all agreed? No members objected, therefore we're agreed. So I'll move on to agenda item two. And agenda item two is Audit Scotland's spring budget revision, 2022-23 budget adjustment. Now, members have got a copy of the spring budget revision, budget adjustment in the meeting papers. And I will welcome to the meeting Professor Alan Alexander, Chair of the Board of Audit Scotland, Stephen Boyle, Auditor General for Scotland, Vicky Bibby, Chief Operating Officer Audit Scotland, William Moyes, Chair of the Accounts Commission, Martin Walker, Director, Corporate Support Audit Scotland, and Stuart Dennis, Corporate Finance Manager, Audit Scotland. And I'd like to wel welcome Vicky Bibby for her first appearance in front of the Commission in her role as Chief Operating Officer. I'll invite uh, Alan Alexander and then the Auditor General to make any short introductory remarks. This is not in the case of the first agenda item, Chair, if that's okay. And we'll do what we've done in the past and do an introduction to the, the major budget item. Is okay. that acceptable? Fine. Stephen, do you have anything you want to... Um, very little, uh, Chair. Most of my remarks, like um, Alan, are f in respect of our 2023-24 budget proposal uh, to the Commission this morning. However, uh, both Stuart Dennis and myself are ready to answer any questions that you or Commission members have on our spring budget revision request. Thank you. Excellent. Well, let me ask a, a first question on the uh, budget revision. Um, the Commission is aware that uh, non-cash pension accounting arrangements have arisen in previous years. With regard to the Lothian Pension Fund, what discussions have you had with the Scottish Government to confirm that previously agreed arrangements with HM Treasury are still in place and will meet this pension adjustment? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm happy to start on that and I'll bring Stuart in a second just to update the Commission on the, the specifics of, of the discussions that we've had. Maybe, as you'll probably see in our, our paper, Chair, that the ongoing volatility of pension adjustments um, requires... Um, the Commission's support to ensure that we are, remain within our financial requirements to break even each year. The volatility of very small changes to um, pension assumptions, discount rates and so forth have a very significant effect on overall valuation. Um, and therefore, both ourselves as a, an admitted body to the Lothian Pension Fund and really all the other members where they're in the circumstances that they can't carry reserves have to look for support. Um, in terms of HMRC and uh, Amy position or the annually managed expenditure budget, Stuart can update the Commission on, on our engagement and uh, happy to broaden that out as you wish. The engagement with the Scottish Government um, happens in November each year. Um, they require us to let them know what our spring budget revision is going to be. Um, and we let them know that so they can then commence um, discussions um, for the whole of the Scottish Consolidated Fund in respect of AMI funding with HM Treasury. So they've got the information that today this is what our revision is required and um, this is what we'll be looking for so they um, have that information. Thank you. Sean, do you want to... Um, in paragraph 16 on page 3, Audit Scotland states that the expectation of continuing low interest rates in the next few years will lead to large accounting adjustments in 2023-24 and beyond. In such circumstances, further requests for budget revisions to meet additional pension charge adjustments will be required in the future. Given recent interest rate increases, what impact do you think um, or do you anticipate on future pension charge adjustments? There, is a, there are changes in interest rates from the historic low levels that we have seen um, in recent years. I think the, um, although that 
the interest rates are increasing, they remain at historically low levels. I think you know, neither myself nor Stuart are actuarial experts and we continue to rely on the um, advice and the assumption expectations that the Lothian Pension uh, provide us. The indications remain that there will be volatility in uh, pension valuations and assumptions that flow. Um, in terms of the overall arrangements, I think as we alluded to in, in the paper, it remains our preference to engage with the SCPA at spring budget revision times when we have more certainty of, of what the likely valuation results will be, rather than to include it in our um, annual budget proposal. So it's, there is something of an element of crystal ball as to kind of what the, the changes might mean, whether it's about interest rates or other assumptions that are used to arrive at the overall pension valuation. So based on our submission today, we are I think, giving as clear a picture as, as we have at our disposal that there's likely to be remaining volatility both in interest rates and the other assumptions that are used to produce the overall valuation. As ever, we'll engage with the Commission as early as we possibly can uh, once we have that information. Okay. Do any other members wish to ask any questions on this? Well, General, do you want to add anything to what you've already said? Um, I think we, we kind of hope our, our proposal uh, chair was clear that, um, and a key point to make, this is a non-cash adjustment. So it's uh, really to, on the basis of uh, valuations and then accounting valuations for what our pension requirements are based on accounting standards. Um, we think this broadly represents the best and, and most transparent way with which to set out what that means, rather than including this uh, pension, non-cash pension adjustment requirements in our budget proposal, um, but keen to continue to engage with the Commission and uh, through and keep you updated as to how that progresses. Thank you. Thank you. In that case, I'll move on to agenda item three, which is Audit Scotland's budget proposal for 2023-24. Uh, this is a consideration of the budget proposal for 2023-24, and members have got a copy of the budget proposal in their papers. Uh, it's the same witnesses for this agenda item. And again, I would invite uh, Alan Alexander, uh, followed by the Auditor General, to make any introductory remarks. Thank you, Chair, and good morning to you and, and the members of the Commission. Um, we're very happy to talk through the proposals and answer any questions that you have on them. I think it's fair to say that over the past two years we've discussed with you uh, and on several occasions the intense pressures on public services and public finances. And as you know, uh, the pandemic exacerbated many of the existing stresses on public bodies, on po political leaders and on public managers. In this past year we've seen and we're now experiencing the impacts of a land war in Europe and an economic crisis added to this most acutely on the cost of living and pressures on household budgets. This volatility and uncertainty and the unfolding impacts of the turbulence of the past two years and a half, two and a half years are going to last for several more years. All of this has created significant additional pressures on Scotland's public bodies. On top of the major stresses and systemic, uh, and, systemic and strategic challenges that they already faced, the response to this has led to increases in public spending and the overhaul and redesign of public services at previously unimaginable scale and pace. In this context, the delivery and development of high quality independent public audit on behalf of the Auditor General and the Accounts Commission is crucial. As you know, Audit Scotland has to change and grow in the past few years in order to be able to respond to these issues, in order to do the bigger and more complex job that is required of us. Um, Audit Scotland is not immune to the pressures that I mentioned earlier on. However, we have, in the construction of a proposed budget, been continuously aware of the need to be prudent while ensuring the integrity of the audit process. Our proposal is based on a series of assumptions that we will discuss today, but the external environment is more volatile than at any time in recent years. 
the Board of Audit Scotland has given continuous oversight and governance to the process of constructing the budget proposal, with particular emphasis on some of the risks that, have effect, that, that are affecting uh, financial planning. This has included um, a board seminar in the summer, um, which we looked uh, without the pressures of having to make a decision at uh, the, the budgetary position. Uh, two formal considerations of the document that you've seen you, before you today uh, of, the draft board, of the draft budget at board meetings. And we also touched upon the whole, the broader questions of financial and budgetary position at a regular business planning session with you in, in, in August. This budget proposal sets out, sets out how we need to ensure that we have the capacity, the skills, the resources to deliver public audit that is robust, relevant, flexible. It will also enable us to further develop and deliver public audit that meets, with the, needs, meets the needs of our wide and diverse groups of stakeholders and ultimately to deliver public audit that drives and support, supports better public spending and, public, uh, and, and better public services. And it has a positive and meaningful impact on the outcomes that people and communities experience and achieve. I think if you asked anybody in, uh, in Audit Scotland what gets it up in the morning, it's that drive for improvement in what we do in the public sector. With your permission, Chair, I'll hand over to Stephen uh, to speak in his capacity as Accountable Officer of uh, Audit Scotland. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Uh, good morning, Chair. Good morning, members. Very grateful for your time this morning and look forward to the conversation. Chair, as, as Alan's outlined in our uh, proposal, over the past two years, the scope and scale of our responsibilities have grown at a rate not seen since we were established back in 2000. Public spending in Scotland has increased by about a fifth and public bodies are and remain stretched to an extent similarly not seen. Although the pandemic has ebbed, public bodies have not had the time nor space they need before further challenges have unfolded. Alan mentioned the cost of living crisis and the very real human impacts that that is having on people, businesses and most importantly from our context, public services. Scotland faces financial risks and issues that are bigger and more com complex than they've ever been. And with the Commission's support, our audit work has responded. Over recent years and in the years ahead, we will focus on ensuring that we have the resources, skills and capacity to fulfil the role that Scotland needs of us now and in the future. Our budget proposal reflects those ambitions. At the heart of this is our focus on innovation and quality of our audit work. Audit quality is the bedrock of the assurance that we look to provide the Parliament and public about how public spending is being used. Over the past two years, we have made progress in addressing previously reported issues affecting audit quality, and we will continue to do so while facing increasing complexity of public spending alongside new requirements for the auditing profession. We are innovating with new approaches to delivering and developing our audit, including digital audits, and ensuring flexibility and responsiveness in our audit programmes. This budget proposal supports the further steps we need to take in innovating and in audit quality. Through all of our audit developments in recent years, both planned and reactive, we have continued to deliver annual audits of almost 300 public sector entities, as well as performance audit on matters of significant public interest. As ever, Chair, this hasn't been easy and a important for me to pay thanks and tribute to the work of Audit Scotland staff as well as those in the audit firms that we work alongside. A resource requirement today for 2023-24 is £11.6 million, an increase of £573,000. This is a rise of 4.8% in cash terms but a decrease of 9.1% in real terms. From our previous discussions, Chair, our budget has decreased in real terms by around a fifth over the past decade. So while the volume of work we do has increased, our total proposed budget of £30.6 million equates to 0.05% of Scotland's public sector budget. 
Our work will focus on key issues such as inequalities and the experience of our most vulnerable citizens, climate change, as well as how communities can shape the services they receive. The largest proportion of our resource requirement from the Parliament is the fees for those bodies that we cannot directly charge. I'm happy to say a bit more about that uh, over the course of our discussion. While in part this reflects the creation of new bodies, for the most part this is to cover the increasing costs and resources required to deliver the audit. The scope of the work, the ways of working and the regulatory requirements on auditors, led in some part by the reviews in recent years of the wider profession, profession have all expanded. Chair, we are clear that the Scottish public audit model provides the Parliament with an independent and robustness, robust service. The five-year change in appointments following a competitive procurement of audit services for external firms have both been completed in the past year. All auditors will be meeting these new requirements. This has meant that the cost of audit is rising for public bodies. As our budget indicates, some of this is reflected in the fee increases for those bodies where we are able to directly charge. We are, as with all public bodies, trying to manage the difficult job of agreeing pay awards that are equitable and reflect the pressure on household budgets and the cost of living, while also being responsible and fair to public finances. And again, as with others, we will remain subject to an inflationary environment in the short term that carries both risk on both pay and non-pay costs. This is an issue we will continue to liaise with the Commission as we navigate over the next year and beyond. Chair, as ever, very grateful for uh, the Commission's time this morning. I will be very much looking forward to engaging with you and answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you. I will just go straight into questions, I think. The um, first question really is a fairly obvious one. There are significant cost pressures uh, identified in the 23-24 uh, budget proposal, particularly in the way of cost of living pay increases for in-house staff. Now, you're looking to uplift April, to the April 2022 20, pay award an amount of 658,000 and a further provision of 615,000 for the April 2023 20, pay awards. Now, the first the obvious question of that is, why are there two years of pay awards required in the 23-24 budget proposals? Because we assume there was a provision in last year's budget proposals uh, in the 2022-23 budget proposal, and you've not sought further cash for that year. How does that work? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to start now. I'll maybe bring Vicky in in a, in a moment, Chair, just to uh, say a bit further as she wishes. So, so you're right, effectively... Um, if, this is you know, one of the biggest risks that, that we are carrying and some of the uncertainty around what pay awards for public sector workers, in, including our own, and reference very briefly to Milpern and remarks that that is both fair and equitable so, so that we are able to um, reflect cost of living pressures uh, that our colleagues are experiencing, while also making sure that we can continue to retain and attract high quality auditors to deliver public audit services. Our budget proposal that the Commission considered in January of uh, this year for 22-23 had budget assumptions of around 2% for, for pay uplift. Following negotiations with our uh, trade union partners, we have settled on a, a pay award of 5% um, in the, the current financial year. It's our expectation that that will flow through into next year's budget and we have a further assumption in the 23-24 proposals that you have before you of a, a further cost of living uh, increase but there's undoubted risk here that the assumptions that we have in the proposal may or may not be sufficient to reflect the market conditions at the time. We've dealt with risk up until now and including last year's budget through management contingency arrangements. But I should say, Chair, that there is real volatility in it and the, the proposal that uh, we present to the Commission today looks to kind of set out that the, um, the level of, I suppose, somewhat relief 
that we felt, and I've been able to agree a pay award in recognising that isn't the case in many other public sector industries at the moment, that we're carrying uncertainty into next year's budget proposal. Chair, I'll pause, and Vicky might want to come in a bit more detail on, on, on where we are at currently. Thank you. Thank you. Just um, without um, risk of um, repeating what Stephen said, um, for the 22-23 um, budget, as Stephen said, we had 2% in it. We settled on 5% um, with staff, which was really good that we've settled both for staff having the money in their um, pockets, but also for us having a um, greater clarity on where our budget is. That extra 3% equated to the 658,000 in our budget for 22-23. We were able to fund that in year this year through savings on slippage of recruitment and savings elsewhere. So we didn't need to come back to the committee and ask for that additional funding. However, the, the way we funded that is by one-off savings. They're not recurring savings because it's slippage largely on recruitment um, and one-off other savings. So the flow through of that will hit the 23-24 budget. And on top of that, we've got the um, proposed uplift for 23-24, where we've not started negotiations on yet. I think we can consider that being a big risk in our budget. We have um, pitched it probably, we reckon, too low. So we want to be quite explicit with that. We don't know where things will, set, um, will settle at. We haven't started negotiations, but I think that's one of the, mo the biggest vulnerabilities in our budget. Um, the budget proposal has a contingency in it, and I think what we would propose to do if there was more would be to fund that from contingency going forward um, for the 23-24 pay award. But we do want to highlight that that is a risk. I hope that explains why um, we've got the two years pay awards coming through, because the first one was funded from non-recurring savings. Can I just ask uh, the... Normally, the, normally Audit Scotland stick approximately to guidelines from the Scottish Government in terms of uh, pay rises and so on. You've adhered to that over the years. Uh, presumably, you've now departed from that uh, to negotiate pay rises based on an industry norm. Again, I can say a wee bit further about that, and uh, Vicky, and, um, we want to say a bit more, I think. We reference in our budget proposal, Chair, that I think it's largely as you describe that Audit Scotland takes very clear reference from Scottish Government public sector pay policy as to uh, expected pay awards, although as an independent body we're, we're not bound by those arrangements as uh, many civil servants are. We also um, received a pay claim from a trade union of 10%. And largely, as you, I think, described here, that we entered into negotiations with them to arrive at what was a fair and hopefully an affordable uh, pay settlement, given the, the differential that we experienced and then the current cost of living arrangements. So we took reference of the negotiations, government pay policy, as well as the pay settlements that were in other parts of the public sector. Notably, uh, local government bodies settled with their workers shortly before Audit Scotland did. I think it's perhaps of interest to the Commission that Audit Scotland members were balloted by their union as alongside other um, PCS uh, area across the whole of the UK. Audit Scotland staff were the only um, part of PCS network that voted to accept the pay award. So I should say that we are very relieved that we're in the circumstances and not facing the prospect of uh, industrial action and disruption to our service. How much is the contingency that you're retaining, which you hope to dip into if you have to go a bit higher on pay next time? Vicky might want to say a bit more on how this is operating, Chair. Vicky. So for the overall budget, the proposition is um, a £500,000 contingency um, on the basis that Audit Scotland can't hold reserves, which I understand has been raised with um, the committee um, before. Um, we think that that is a prudent contingency in the, on the basis of the 
um, for pay award, looking at where we've pitched our budget, um, is quite low from where we know um, other um, organisations are pitching their 23-24 budget. Um, also, other areas for the cont contingency will be other um, non-pay inflation. Um, for an example, we've just received... Um, an alert that we think that our rates revaluation will cost an additional 75000 for the organisation. What we want to do with this budget is manage those inflationary pressures within what we are asking um, from the committee. Um, we will look to do that through the contingency and other efficiencies within the budget going forward. Um, but we want to be transparent around the risks, but also our um, appetite to manage um, those risks within the budget. It's not a huge contingency, given all the risks out there. I'm going to bring Mark Ruskell in at this point. I think he's got a supplementary. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I wanted to ask you just about that, um, you know, the, the difference in pay. Is there a difference in pay between what you're paying your staff and the private sector bodies that are, that are delivering similar work? Um, and, and how you're kind of managing that? So you, you've spoken about the negotiation with union colleagues and, you know, 10% was put on the table. But I, I'm interested in, in what other ways you're supporting retention, making employment with yourselves an attractive proposition compared to, you know, working with a, with a private body. We've got really, really productive um, relationships with the PS, and we have quite open discussions um, around these. The pay award wasn't just financial. Um, just to talk about the financial side of it, though, um, we agreed a 5% um, uplift or um, for um, the lower end pay um, um, £2,000. We look at, Looking at where, say, local government settled, there's a cap on that, and discussions with... Um, the union, we agreed that it wouldn't be appropriate to have a cap because of the competitive environment with the external firms and our ability to retain staff. Um, we know that some of the other firms have, although in some ways um, it's bottom loading, have reached 10% pay awards and are also looking at over the summer periods, working four day weeks. So as part of our negotiations, negotiations we agreed to look at the four day working week we've not committed to doing it but we certainly in partnership will look at um, the benefits and the studies that have been done on these areas we do offer flexible working um, packages to our staff which um, are well received um, we have clo we have regular staff consultation um, a number of surveys um, with staff. So we have really good um, working relationships. We touched on the pension. We do. We are part of the local government. Uh, we're an admitted body into the local government pension scheme. So we do believe that we offer a competitive um, proposition to staff. However, given the um, recruitment market at the moment, and we're seeing a number of our um, the clients struggling for financial. Um, expertise within the areas, we certainly can't be complacent. So I think the ongoing discussions with the um, PCS and our staff on the whole are really important. That's why we've highlighted the risk in the budget around where we have pitched next year's pay award, because it probably is on the low side. Just, I'm just thinking, if I, if I was working for your organisation and I saw a private sector body that was paying paying more, what, what, would, what would encourage me to, to continue to work for, you, for yourselves? Sorry, Stephen. So, okay. I mean, I think Vicky's right, Mr. Ruskell, actually, is that our offer isn't just salary based. You know, so there's a. People come, people join Audit Scotland, and we have many colleagues who have worked their entire career with us, and, you know, and others who devote decades of service mm -hmm. because of the, the ethos that they share about delivering good value for public spending and for you know, supporting improvement. In, in how public services are operating, the thing for us, so we can't take that for granted, you know, because you know, think really, really carefully manage that there doesn't become a chasm between you know, what our offer is relative to those of, of other public bodies. Vicky's quite rightly described, you know, so our, our pension arrangements, our flexible working arrangements, the relationships that we have with our trade unions, um, and the overall environment that we want to give colleagues in Audit Scotland is all part of our. Um, retention strategy. We're also looking at the metrics about you know, our turnover rates and as well as the level of applicants that we're getting. 
it's fair to say that you know, the volume of applications is dropping slightly, um, and our turnover, I think as we discussed at, uh, at a recent session with the, the Commission, is also increasing marginally too. Um, we need to continue keeping a close eye on this. So there is, there is inevitably going to be increased risk when some of the private sector firms are offering uh, pay settlements of 10% when we are settling at 5%. Um, if that differential continues into the longer term, then I think that becomes a much more difficult proposition for us to manage. I'm going to add, Vicky. Just, just one very small yeah. Add, if I may, um, we're also being very clear with our staff that we've got a different proposition from the private firms. Um, you know, our unique selling point, um, we believe, is that we are here to make a difference. And actually, you can make a difference for the communities of Scotland and that public. And we're wanting to, uh, our, our recruitment fairs that we do with graduates, we're um, highlighting that that is a real selling point. We're also looking at our role in terms of being an anchor institution for the public sector and looking at expanding our modern apprentices, our school leavers programmes and looking at different pathways into um, the work um, as well. So not just relying on, say, the traditional graduate um, route in, but looking at other op opportunities for tackling inequalities as well. I mean, that, that, that sounds attractive and, and for anybody wanting a career where they can really make a difference on those key issues, inequalities, climate, um, you know, improving society, that's great. But is there not a challenge inherent there with the blended model that you've got with delivery in-house and then private sector delivery and that you, you, could, you could actually be doing that work in the private sector and be getting potentially better pay for that as well? I'm being devil's advocate here. And, and, you know, it's a perfectly valid challenge. Um, so it's been a long time since I worked in, a, in an audit firm, Mr Ruskell, but um, there, are, there are quite different environments what I'm saying, to what uh, we are looking to offer our colleagues. I think particularly the, the overall volume of you know, benefits. So the work you might be doing the same, but similarly you're very unlikely to have a defined benefit pension scheme, the extent of flexible working, um, probably some of the certainty that I think we can offer our colleagues too. So, you know, people, we've, we doing, whilst encouraging people to work across Audit Scotland and both financial audit and performance audit, people are able to specialise, work in dedicated teams. They broadly have certainty um, that can support um, both their career development and also responsibilities that they have outside of work. So we look to, to manage all of these competing requirements. Um, I, th I guess the key message we want to give the Commission today is that we're not complacent about those risks. That, you know, we understand that um, we remain in a competitive environment for skills. And I just endorse the point that Vicky makes is that that's, there's a real onus us, on us in that case to making sure that we broaden out our entry points into the organisation that you know, we're not just saying that you have to have a, a 2-1 degree to come and join Audit Scotland. That actually, we broaden out our modern apprenticeship and the various entry points and routes into a career in audit, and that's a, a focus for us in the year ahead. You can bring Daniel Johnson in at this point. Um, thank you uh, very much, Convener. Just digging into this point a little bit further, both in terms of <clears throat> salary increases and indeed the contingency since it's been brought up. Um, I've been talking very much in response to Mr. Ruskell's questions about uh, sort of the qualitative aspects. Given that you are accountants, I wonder if I can just ask you about the numbers. Um, and in particular, you know, this is an industry that is widely understood, clear transferable skills. Therefore, how have you compared your salary uplifts to industry norms and what, what is the industry running at in terms of salary increases? So, um, it's not as transparent as, um, so, would we compare ourselves with some of the big four? Um, where I think pu quite publicly PwC has said there's been a 10% increase. That's not right across the board. And as I said earlier, they're, they're looking at different, I think some of the medium firms, size firms, we are um, quite similar. But at the moment for this year, they've not published it, um, those, so to make a direct in-year comparison. Um, we do have... Um, 
as part of the procurement exercise, um, quite close working um, relationships with the firms. I think more on a bilateral basis, I think um, information sharing, um, we've got to be very careful because of their commercial um, basis. I think the real metrics is what which we would want to look at is our um, people leaving us. People, the attraction, we, I mean, we've still got 48 graduates coming in. Um, we are not losing many people to industry um, at the moment, but um, we um, do want to be careful um, and keep a close eye on this. We speak with uh, other agencies across the UK um, and they are particularly experiencing a lot of loss um, to the firms, um, particularly at the graduate recruitment stage and also um, in um, audit manager and senior manager level. We are not experiencing that, but we're, in, um, but we're not being complacent around that. We know that that is a risk. Um, so I don't have, I think the question, you know, what, what are we, what's our offering compared to exactly what the firms, I don't have that information at the moment, that's not being I shared with not, us. I, I, my, I mean, I, my question really isn't about individual firms and your comparison to them, but it's actually the profession as a whole. And given that it, it is a regulated profession, that there are industry bodies, I'm assuming that there's, there's, there's sort of industry-wide salary surveys that are carried out, do you use those? Uh, and, and actually, do you undertake a, a formal benchmarking process? And if so, could you just set out how that operates? I'm happy to say a wee bit further about that, actually. So, yes, we do use salary scales. So there are, they are published by you know, um, Hayes and others, you know, regularly published salary scales that set out. So, so we reference those, as do our trade union partners, I should say, uh, Mr Johnson, that you know, when they submit pay claims, that is part of the overall consideration. Um, Vicky's covered the firms, but I think it's, it's as relevant to say that people will join and leave Audit Scotland to other parts of the public sector, which is potentially as, as much a valid comparison. You know, so whether it's you know, a, a finance role in the NHS, central government, local government, will be as likely to see that as, an, as a career path as they will be to go and join um, an accountancy firm, perhaps even more so. So I think really part of our earlier conversation with the chair, I think the fact that we have settled a, a pay claim this year that is consistent with local government and is also uh, likely to be higher than some of the pay settlements, particularly that it's the Scottish Government public sector pay policy affords flexibility to public bodies to settle their pay but it really is down to individual public bodies. So that the reliability of some of the, um, the salary skills and numbers reduces to an extent uh, as a result of that. Benchmarks. I mean, I, I believe not, I, don't, I couldn't find the most recent figures, but the, 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 the previous years that, that Hayes produced, I think it was 3%. So it just obviously be useful to understand where uh, Audit Scotland stands in relation to that and, and did your rationale for when you step away, which is ultimately the purpose of a benchmarking exercise. So there's, so, so there's more options for us to do. I think at, at the moment, in terms of our overall uh, pay and reward package, um, you can probably you can very clearly tell from our proposal and, and our responses this morning that we are relieved that we have been able to resolve our pay arrangements this year. What we don't yet have a, a plan to do is whether that leads us to a place that we need to do a whole-scale review of grade rates within the organisation. Um, I, I don't think we're in that place at the moment based on the metrics in terms of our <coughs> recruitment and retention arrangements. And I think that our offer um, being wider than just the salary is giving us some comfort, not complacency, that you know, particularly um, pension arrangements and the flexible working offer that we make to uh, our employees as well as prospective hires is giving us um, some security, but only some, and I think it's something just to reassure the Commission we're keeping it under close review. So, so just, I mean, following on the other, the other things which are obviously impact on that salary line are, are the overall uh, numbers and indeed your, your turnover. Can I just clarify what the numbers are just in terms of turnover? I mean, I see in Appendix 4 there's a 2% vacancy turnover <coughs> assumption. Is that, is that the assumption and how has that borne out and compared to the actual turnover rate in the, over the last 
uh, period. Yeah, Vicky might want to say a wee bit more about this, actually, but I think, um, as, as I mentioned, our turnover is increasing. So that, and um, that inevitably, it, it takes time to recruit people, and turnover, it, it, well, I should say, it takes time to recruit people, but it takes longer, typically, for us to bring somebody into the organisation than the notice period that the person who is leaving the organisation um, works with us. Largely, we want to be casting our net as widely as possible. And that's got, that's got pluses and minuses, I should say, uh, uh, as a consequence to that. Um, so in having fair, transparent, open competition, we want to bring you know, a real diverse group of people into Audit Scotland. And that's taking longer than it is for, for people to work their notice <coughs> and leave. Um, that's led us to a point that 2% is about kind of um, right in terms of efficiency savings, and you know it can vary in terms of what that means for overall turnover. But our turnover is higher than the, the two percent. And colleagues may wish to elaborate. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Mark. Yeah. So in 21-22, mm. uh, voluntary turnover was just over six percent. Um, but of course, the turnover and the vacancy rate assumptions that we make aren't exactly the same thing because we're talking about two slightly different things, of course. Um, but I would say that that particular year was probably higher than we've been used to in the past. Um, I think the thing with the chain, pending change to the audit appointments, uh, and as people are aware, changes that have been at the senior level in Audit Scotland maybe means that isn't a re truly representative figure. Um, but as, uh, as Stephen has said, something that we, we do keep a close eye on. Um, we're doing okay at the moment, uh, but there are certainly risks there. And if, um, as Stephen and Vicky both said, um, the rates change, uh, you know, the demand for certain expertise in the market starts really starts to widen that gap, then there's no doubt that will be a bit of a challenge for us. So if you've been running at 6%, is 2% a safe assumption? I think it's safe to say that I think we would be reluctant to go as high as that as for a financial assumption that, you know, we're going to continue operating at, at 6% in terms of turnover. And it, as, as Martin's right, they're not... Not exactly the same, you, you, you know, uh, in terms of what that might mean for a... But they shouldn't be... I mean, 4% delta is quite quite large if your actuals are 6%, but your, your plan in front of us is 2 I, So there's, there's an element of um, the nature of how our budget is constructed, how we operate, and that we cannot break even each year means that we have to look to have some certainty. I think... In terms of managing some of that risk as going as high, even you know four percent or, or six percent, would be an extent probably a, an additional risk that I think I, I would feel uncomfortable in recommending through our budget proposal uh, through our board and to the commission. But if we are operating at higher than um, you know, four percent, six percent, where we get to in turnover rates, I think probably there's a couple of things we want to do. What that means for our financial assumptions, but perhaps also how we are bringing people into the organisation um, as well. That it is. I alluded to it earlier, Mr Johnson, but some employment markets are moving incredibly quickly. Our, for example, our uh, digital services or IT department, that the pace with which those services for recruitment are moving um, was faster than we were able to keep up with. So we've had to look really closely at how we're engaging in that market and recruitment so that we're able to access the skills. And we've applied some modification to our recruitment arrangements to allow us to bring people in just by way of anecdote, Chair, that you know, for some of those services, jobs are being advertised, recruited for, and, and people starting within a week. And public bodies historically haven't operated as quickly as that to, to, uh, to sustain access to those services. I mean, I could ask more questions about the assumptions in your, your people line, but I think in the interest of time, I'll move on. But, but just given that the, the point around contingency has been raised. Can I just ask uh, uh, you some, some further details about actually how the 500,000 um, figure, of, uh, I know that's not an exact quote, um, ha ha has been arrived at? I mean, is that, uh, you, uh, is that uh, derived from your risk register? Or if not, you know, what, what's the methodology that has arrived at? And indeed, what, what proportion of uh, the, the contingency would you see is, 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 is uh, a, a ascribed to your, your potential risks around salary costs and salary increases? I'm, I'm happy to start on this, actually, and I think Vicky and maybe Stuart also might want to, to say a bit more about um, how precise that figure is and, and kind of what supports it. And I think 
the, the answer largely, it's not a precise science that, that we've arrived at a figure of half a million pounds of, of contingency. In terms of fundamentals, Audit Scotland has to break even each year, so um, we're not able to hold reserves the, with the way we are constituted. Um, if, you know, in, in its most basic terms, aside from reputational damage, our accounts would be qualified in the event that we uh, failed to break even, not a position I think any of us would want to find ourselves in. So we look to have a degree of contingency buffer to support volatility in our, in our financial arrangements. Going back to the early stages of the pandemic, at that point it became clear that our half a million pound contingency was going to be insufficient to cope with the change in the progress of audit work, which effectively is our, our biggest um, variable. Stuart can, can happily say more about and We spend a lot of time focusing on what we call work in progress, which is the main variable for us in terms of expenditure and income, and what that really is a measure of how much work has been completed. Complexity also derives from the fact that uh, yet we report, as all public bodies do, towards a, a March year end in terms of uh, financial results, but our audit year is not doesn't follow that pattern. So the audit years for NHS audits runs to the end of uh, June, local government audits into uh, September, October time, and for some central government bodies right through to the end of December. So managing all of these variables, uh, and as we've seen through the pandemic, it hasn't been entirely predictable how an audit would progress, with us about you know, availability of public bodies to support the audit, and then um, our own arrangements. So these are all the real <coughs> set of variables that, that we're dealing with. So it's not a precise science, um, but we think that that half a million pound gives us enough of a buffer to cope with some of the variables. Stuart may want to come in and say a bit more about some of the, the precision within that. Yeah, I, I would just um, highlight on the, the conversation a couple of points. Um, in, in respect of the the 2% vacancy factor, and I know this was probably highlighted um, in some of the answers, is, is that that 2% represents the whole year. So the, we will get times where it does rise up to maybe 6% or whatever, but over, we've, we've applied a 2% over the whole year and the timing of when vacancies occur might mean that the actual percentage in turnover is higher but within the overall scan, um, span of things, that 2% of the whole year will be within a financial envelope. Um, the, the actual contingency, um, the risks, and I think, I think it's included in the report, is um, for every 1%, uh, it represents about 220000 to our pay bill. So obviously that's quite a big risk that we're trying to manage there. Uh, and we look at the, the contingency, previously it was at um, 300,000 and um, during COVID we increased it to 500 um, especially with all the risks around on that and these risks are continuing and, and more more so and I think as Vicky had mentioned earlier there are things cost of living pressures and things that we're having to try and absorb as well so we're taking on board within the risk register all the various things of what we would need to do to be able to manage within the budget that we've put before you today. Um, so it's, absolutely there are risks within this budget, I think that's to emphasise that. But but we do feel that the 500,000 is a reasonable, it represents just, just under 1.5% of our total budget. So we feel it's a fair representation of, of what we would, would need without having to come back for any additional funding. I've probably used up more of my time, but can I ask one very blunt bottom line question? Looking at the overall budget request of 346.9 million, that represents a 4.8% increase on your previous year's budget. I would just note that that 4.8% is seems incredibly close to the GDP deflator for the, the coming financial year of 4.8%. Of, of I just want to understand was that your starting point or, or is it is it a bottom up and I hope you don't mind me asking this question because I always uh, I'm sure auditors would agree with me that you should always take a closer look at coincidences when they occur and when numbers um, seem to match one another I'm happy to assure you Mr Johnson it's entirely coincidental that that is the, uh, the the two figures match okay Thank you very much 
I've obviously got Colin looking at that now. I'm, I'm, I'm finished there. Oh, good. Um, so can I just make one, one, one point? And, uh, as, as a result of the previous interchanges, um, Mr Johnson talked about the fact that risk is really important in this. Let me just assure the Commission that a very large percentage of what I would call the governance time of the board is spent on risk uh, through the audit committee and the, and the board itself. Uh, and, you know, I think that we are really quite seized about what the risks are and how they need to be managed. And we try to manage them in a way that is the, the most economical way of manage them, managing them. And there's nothing in here that we could not, I think, uh, justify in terms of the risks that we've assessed. Uh, just to give you an example, one of the continuing red risks we have is how we deal with cyber security. And that is something that we talk about very, very regularly, because if you're looking for a hot employment market, that's where you find it. And it's pretty hot among auditors as well, but it's really hot in, in cyber security. So we're all, we're all over that. Um, and I think that uh, the numbers we've got here, given the assumptions we've had to make, um, are as good as they can be at this stage. OK, well, let me just uh, move on here. Uh, can I ask Sharon Dowie if she has any questions? Thank you. Audit Scotland is required to directly charge certain audited bodies and relies in Parliament to fund audit work for those bodies which it can't build directly. <laughs> so in paragraph 70, Audit Scotland states that it requires to increase fees by 19.4% in order to break even. Could you explain the difference between the increase in fees to be billed for chargeable audits versus the resource sought from Parliament, which is used to meet the cost of non-chargeable audits, which is only 4.8%? It's quite a significant difference. It is, actually, and I suspect there's a number of colleagues who want to contribute to, to answering uh, your question, Deputy Chair. The, at its most fundamental level, we we can charge some bodies and not others, depending on the legislation that accompanies the creation of public bodies. Um, so, for example, you know, one of the, the key contributors to our additional request uh, to the Commission today from the Consolidated Fund is as a consequence of the creation of ScotRail Holdings as a public body and the associated audit requirements from that. We, we're not able to charge a fee to Scott Real. In terms of the kind of more wider aspects, and actually I'm, I'm, I'm sure Alan might want to say a bit more about some of the, the fee arrangements from as a result of the procurement, given the, the very important role he played as kind of chairing some of our procurement arrangements, that we market tested every five years the, um, the cost of audit through um, public tender arrangements. For, for audit firms. Um, we do that so that we are able to um, you know, have an, an, a, a comparison in terms of our own cost base, but also that we are able to continue accessing expertise from uh, audit firms, again, subject to our overall quality environment. And that's after a, a long, thorough process where we ended up at with the appointment of five audit firms um, to deliver audit services for the next five years number of real consideration we gave to the prices that we received, as well as the quality of the bids. We interviewed all of uh, the submissions and, we've, and lots for us to follow through and not just the, the audits that they'll be providing on an annual basis, but also the sharing of skills and, and intelligence that we require to support both the Accounts Commission's requirements and, and those of my own over the next five years. We think that it gives us price certainty and predictability in an audit market that elsewhere in the UK has been incredibly volatile. We don't you know, have to look too hard to see um, what happens when there isn't that certainty. Um, the local government audit environment in England, for example, has been an incredibly challenging um, uh, a set of circumstances where you know, they, by coincidence, have also gone to the market for audit services. Uh, from firms and seen that their prices have increased by 150% for, for those audit services. So, yes, our prices are increasing, but it, 
uh, but there's variation in, and sorry, I'll, 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 I'll stop for in a second. <laughs> is that the um, the last context, uh, Deputy Chair, is that Audit Scotland, by legislation, um, has to charge on a sectoral basis where we can charge a fee, and we by and large have to break even on a sector basis, and that reflects the variation by sector that we have as a result of market testing. So we're, we don't want to cross-subsidise by sector, and that's what has got us to, based on the, the submissions that we received from the firms, reflects both the variation and difference. And the non-chargeable element that you referred to is as a consequence of uh, the nature of the bids that we received by sector. I'm sure others will want to come in and say a bit more about this, but maybe start with you, Alan. Thanks, Stephen. Um, I think I've mentioned to the Commission before the, the value that we place on the uh, intelligence that we get from having a mixed market approach to how we do the audits of the public sector. That said, when we, did, when we started the process of um, seeking to engage auditors for a further five years, um, back in nine, uh, 2019, um, I, the, the board then asked me to chair the, ste the steering group. It was very clear at the beginning of that process that we had no certainty that the market would come out for the, for, for the, the, the work that we were offering. Uh, we, the, the, there was always the possibility that they would decide that what we could pay was something that they uh, couldn't live with. In fact, one of the big four uh, uh, pulled out at a very, uh, a very early stage. All of that market intelligence feeds in to how we price things uh, and how we construct a budget. Uh, and we get a lot of information in terms of comparability uh, through the way in which we manage the external contracts. As it happened, as Stephen mentioned earlier, five firms came out, we assessed their bids, and they have now, they, each of them now has a portfolio of audits that they will be uh, beginning on um, about now. There's one other aspect of this that feeds in to budget going forward, and that is that the way in which we've um, structured the contracts that we have is that the, it is a five-year appointment for each of the firms, and the uplift that they can expect year on year is pegged to the uplift in Audit Scotland's staff costs. So that seems to me to be a really effective way of maintaining discipline and also maintaining the, the value of comparability and market intelligence. Thank you. Is there any risk that non-chargeable audited, body, audited bodies are being cross-subsidised by the bodies that are billed for their audit work? I, I think we're managing that risk really carefully so that that isn't the case. And certainly on a... That, and Stuart, you may want to say a bit more about just precisely how we do this, but um, we are absolutely clear that we are not cross-subsidising between different sectors of public bodies. But Stuart, you manage that very carefully. Yeah, no, absolutely. That This sector analysis is... is um robust to make sure that there is no cross-subsidisation. Cross um, what I would say is that um, what Stephen and, and, and Alan have said is, is this gave us very useful market information in respect to the cost of audit and the way we did the procurement. So why, uh, while you'll see different percentage increases across different sectors, it's low in, in the non-chargeable um, but, but we collected that information as well as part of our exercise to, to see that the cost of audit rep is a fair representation of the market at the moment. So, so that is, is um, absolutely the, the approach we've taken. So there is no cross-subsidy cross at all. And finally, further analysis of the increase in fees is provided in Appendix 3, page 23, Audit fees to be charged to further education colleges are expected to increase by 57.5% in 2023-24 from 22-23. Could you explain why there's such a significant increase in the fees to be paid by this sector in particular? Yeah, I'm happy to start on that and, uh, and Stuart may want to come in as well. So fundamentally it's about the... Um, so there's no cross subsidisation of kind of... Um, Hopefully not laboured that point, Deputy Chair, but ultimately this is about 
the market cost to deliver services to um, different sectors of the public sector. And for the delivery of further education colleges have historically um, not broken even for you know, what it actually costs to deliver uh, an auditing standards compliant audit alongside the uh, meeting the requirements of the Code of Audit Practice that set by the Auditor General and the Accounts Commission, coupled with, um, in the previous procurement round, audit firms gave um, significant discounts in the, the cost of uh, delivering audit for all the reasons that we spoke about, about you know, the increasing costs so in terms of pay and other services, that, um, that has led to the point that the cost for some sectors are significantly higher than uh, the prevailing rate of inflation. So a variety of factors. In overall terms, whilst the percentage increase um, is much higher than other sectors, the comparable cost of the audit fee remains a lot lower than in, than in other settings. And we can support the committee with further information around that uh, as you wish. Uh, if, you, if you allow me, I'll just check in with Stuart and other colleagues if there's anything that I haven't addressed properly in that. No, that, that covers every, every point on, on that. That's the reason why um, it, it is around the Code of Audit Practice, international auditing standards, and, and that is the information we've got as the market, that that's how much it costs to do audit for that sector. Um, okay, right, thank you. Can I bring Daniel Johnson in? Yeah, I, I'm not sure I entirely actually follow what you've just said set out there. When you're saying market costs, are you, are you saying that essentially that the cost in terms of the, 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 the be next best alternative foregone, i.e. if you went out to the market, that's what they would charge? Or are you saying it is uh, just 57.5% more expensive to do an audit on a college because of the nature of the work and the things you're having to verify? And if so, could you explain that? Or are you saying that actually that, that, that there's been a change in circumstances in that sector compared to, to others, compared to previous years? Because, I mean, that's ultimately what we're saying, is that, that it's going up. So is, it, is there been a change in what you're requiring to do an audit? I mean, what is it that is making, you know, a, a doing an audit in a college more than half more expensive again uh, than it was previously as compared to uh, local government the NHS which I would have in, if, if you were going to ask me to guess I'd have said what they do is more complicated than what a college does and therefore uh, you know, they would be the ones that, that were more complicated to audit so I'm just can what yeah you know, where's this cost actually coming from so I'm very happy to elaborate and clarify um, as, as best I can. So, so there's a, all of the factors that you've mentioned are relevant into why the cost is increasing. Um, auditors, both um, those that work in-house for Audit Scotland and the firms, um, have told us, and through our own monitoring, have said that it, it's costing more to deliver uh, a ISA-compliant international standards and auditing meeting the requirements of the Code of Audit Practice, the increasing quality um, requirements that are applied to the auditing profession than the fees that were available to deliver those audits. So for really effectively for the previous five year appointment round, auditors on some audits and college sector notably haven't been able to break even for what it costs to deliver the audit. I mentioned the fact that the in the previous procurement round, which would be six years ago now, audit firms offered discounts to secure work from Audit Scotland. When we structured the tender exercise this year, for all the reasons we've spoken about with the Deputy Chair, we're not able to uh, cross-subsidise by sector. So the bids that we receive reflect what auditors say will uh, take to deliver those services. Not just this year, but just to finish, for the next five years. So there's price certainty you know, so, yes, we're seeing, and I know that's a hard sell, Mr Johnson, that there's an increase in costs this year. But um, for some, if public bodies were to go to the market for audit services, they're unlikely to secure a contract for five years. They, so they are carrying a degree of risk. So for all of those factors has led to a point that uh, the audit fees by that, for that sector in particular are increasing. 
Um, but it's also the case that they are considerably lower than they would be for um, NHS local government bodies, given their scale. But there is almost there is a cut-off point as to what it can take to deliver um, a quality audit, and the prices that were being charged previously were below that line. Revised standards, it, it's taking more effort to get to that point with colleges than other bodies. Is that fundamentally what you're saying? And, and that's then reflected in what, what, what bids are you, you're getting in from the private sector? To, is, is, that, is that the fundamental driver? It's not, it's not just taking more effort. It's taking uh, effort across every sector. But to get to that minimum line, there was a bigger gap than was the case in so colleges. What is that? sector that, that's so, requiring that much because it's such a substantial amount more so it's not uh, just, so i'm absolutely clear it's not specific to the college sector but it's because the, the fees that we have we are charging to the college sector and i should say also the case to some central government bodies as well some of these are very small bodies but yet they still require by legislation uh, uh, a quality audit so to deliver that quality audit the, the rates that were being charged weren't sufficient to adequately break even. So yes, there is inc increasing complexity in some parts of the, the college sector that has gone through regionalization and, and so forth. But it's not the case that it's directly attributable. It's a case of that the bids that we receive require us to break even, and that's what reflecting in the rates. And, and do, you check, if, if, do you check those bids against what you think it would cost you to do that work yourself? Yeah, we do, and I can bring Vicky in in a moment, and this actually about our own analysis is that we. Audit Scotland hasn't done as many college audits as uh, as the firms for many years. We have um, only done a handful of those in house. In the so bringing us up to that point, um, and even looking at our own analysis, is that we were similarly struggling to break even on particular audit jobs on colleges, as a, a by virtue of what it was required in terms of quality standards. By a sixty percent gap. And so, that, that, Vicky, you might say a bit more about this, but part of it is catch-up, but it's also uh, reflecting the fact that um, this is a five-year tender. Mm. So that so audit firms and ourselves need, I know, have kind of capturing some price certainty over the course of the next five years. Um, I'll pause for me, Mr. Joss. I'm sure Vicky wants to elaborate. I absolutely agree with everything. It's just maybe a point to emphasise um, the relationship between the cost and the size of the organisation is not completely linear and some of the FEs compared to say local government are much smaller organisations so as Stephen says there is a minimum cost with all the new standards that are compliant so um, some of the smaller bodies proportionately have to pay more and it's getting it up to that standard after that it's a bit more linear the relationship between the size of the body um, and the fees but I think what you're seeing explicitly in the colleges of where they've been, of where we are now, of the cost of a minimum audit to make sure you're compliant with all the new standards, that relationship is not linear. So a lot of them are having to move up to that baseline, if that helps. That means, yes, that, that, that price point. Would, would you be able to share with the Commission in writing what, what the, 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 the standards are that have, have driven this? That yeah. have been, I, mean, I won't ask you to enumerate them for now. Can I bring Richard Leonard in? I think he's got a supplementary in this one. Yes, and then I'll go on to my next question, I think. Colin. I mean, I think, I think the, um, the, the reason, of course, that we are um, interested in that is just because from one year to the next, there is a massive increase, 57.5%. Sounds massive, and so does that tell us there has been a failure in the preceding period, uh, or, you know, is, 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 is there something that's been... It sounds a lot more than an adjustment. It sounds like quite a substantial leap in the fees that have been charged to FE colleges? I, um, I'll pass to Stuart in a second, Mr Leonard, actually, just to say a bit more about if we have information at our disposal, what it's likely to mean for an individual college, given that the scale of audit fee charged to some bodies is much less in a college setting than it is in some of our other public bodies. So percentage-wise, it's significant, but in terms of actual public spending, it's, it's not quite as acute as it, as it looks. To address your, your wider point, first of all, though, um, the requirements upon auditors is changing in terms of quality standards, um, senior input into audits as well. The, the Commission will be a, you know, very familiar with some of the failures that there's been in the audit profession, um, largely 
in uh, a commercial setting. With some, so in the regulatory environment that we operate in has led to increasing uh, focus on quality, more time spent on um, file review, more after-the-fact quality reviews, and more senior input into audits. All of that is driving cost higher in the auditing profession. Um, and I, I, again, I don't wish to labour the point, but when we reference the price that we've received against some of the uh, factors that are applying in other parts of the UK, we're still seeing a differential so that in terms of the, um, the market that we have here, alongside the fact that um, we are pleased and somewhat relieved that uh, we have a market for audit services in Scotland that there's some degree of doubt, given that, as uh, the Chair has mentioned, that um, one of the big four declined to engage in the market. So we think there's a variety of factors, but quality standards are the most significant. Stuart, do you have any information to just to support some of the example of the change in price? I, I don't have the exact figures. I would say that, that they're all, all of a similar size, I think, has been, that's been mentioned. Um, and the 57% is a lot in percentage terms. I think when it comes to the actual financials, it, you know, I can, we can provide that information and can have a look at that. Um, but um, the, the reason it is, it is, as Stephen says, it is that that's what we require to break even. As part of the procurement exercise, I think, um, in the previous conversation, what, what we did do is we actually did do in-house costing as well. So all the all the bodies that were responsible for auditing, we said, well, so we had a comparison and a benchmark to, to measure what we were getting in from the firm. So And that come out at um, reasonable figures that we could award the contracts to. So, um, but I'm quite happy to... Uh, provide more, more details on the actual um, pounds in relation to the increases. I, th I think, um, I think, Chair, that would, be, uh, that would be useful. Can I move on to another um, area that, um, uh, that I think we wanted to uh, uh, challenge you a little bit on? And that is, if I look at, um, at page six, the uh, paragraph 10, it kind of summarizes uh, the net increase that you are looking for. And, uh, you know, roughly, um, uh, £563,000 is the net uh, additional uh, figure that you're looking for an uplift uh, from uh, the Parliament. Um, and, but if, by my calculations, around about half of that is as a result of an increase in funding support to the Accounts Commission. Could you um, maybe elaborate why that uh, significant increase is there? I th hopefully, you, with your con uh, consent, Mr Lennon, I'm going to pass to Bill, who I think is the best place to take the Commission through that. Yes. Um, what, when I was appointed, just, just to give a wee bit of context, when I was appointed, the Minister um, made clear to me that he was happy with the audit of the local government, but he was not happy with the Commission's impact, and he wanted us to make much more impact than we were making. And he wanted to be confident that he was getting independent and objective assessments of financial stability and service quality, and that where there were problems, we were fixing them. So that, that's the objective that I think has been set for the Commission, is, is go and make more impact uh, and make sure that uh, there are no serious problems in local authorities that we're not missing, that we're not hitting, rather. Uh, and that really meant that, in our view, we had to increase our profile with the Parliament and that we had to be able to demonstrate that our work is having a lasting impact on service, uh, service quality. Um, and to do that, we needed more dedicated resource. The, the Commission at that stage had, I think, two or maybe three members of staff of Audit Scotland who were dedicated to supporting the Commission. Um, so we have decided, first of all, to have a change programme in the Commission that will tackle some of the deficiencies that I felt and the Commission felt uh, in our organisation and in our running. And we particularly wish to appoint a controller of audit. Um, previously, certainly for some years, the role of controller of audit was a, undertaken by one person who was also the director of um, performance and best value. Uh, and having it split like that, as far as the commission is concerned, is no longer viable because just the workload for a start and the planned workload. Uh, and we are planning to do quite a lot more 
to challenge local authorities where we see problems and make sure that they are getting on with sorting out the problems they have. So that, that's uh, a big part of the uh, increase to the uh, Accounts Commission is the cost of uh, a controller of audit. So how much of that um, quarter of a million pounds is going into the salary of the new controller of audit and how much is going into other areas of expenditure? The controller of audit is costing 155,000, so roughly half the increase goes there. But, that, but currently there is a, presumably there is a resource which is um, is, I mean, it's in Audit Scotland, isn't it, that that post has resided? I don't, I don't know what the current configuration is. Yes, that's right. I mean, in, in the past, the, uh, the, the post, as I said, was covered by someone who also had another job to do, which was performance and best value. Uh, and the Commission's quite clear that that wasn't delivering the service that we needed to meet the Minister's challenge, to make sure that we were really tackling issues in local authorities. This is a proposal which has come to this commission from the board of Audit Scotland? Yeah? Yes, because the commission is dependent entirely under the legislation on Audit Scotland for services and resourcing. We don't carry a budget of our own. We are dependent on Audit Scotland funding what we need. Okay. And so you've described that this will meet the salary of a comptroller of audit. But, and the rest of the additional expenditure uh, bill, what's, what's that for? Well, we want to, to create a small secretariat for the commission, which we don't have at present. We have two or possibly three people. Uh, and we want to add a couple of more posts to do analytical work mainly on the performance of local authorities uh, and to help us with stakeholder relations, finding out what's going on. That, that's about 65,000, I think, from memory. We do need to improve our website because our website is very tangled up with Audit Scotland's website. We need to just build our presence a bit better, but those are relatively small sums of money. I mean, you, you say it's tangled up, but I mean, a lot of the work that you do is, uh, is either work that you commission Audit Scotland to do or else is, a you know, is badged as a joint report, isn't it? Yes, and there are strengths and weaknesses in that. I mean, if, if we want to, as we think we have to, increase our public profile and increase our profile with the Parliament and with government and so on, we need to have a much more uh, easily accessible website and documentation and so on than we have. It, when I first started, I found it quite difficult to find out information about the Commission and what it was doing and what it was achieving. So we want to just pull that apart a little bit and make sure that our website is a lot clearer than it is at present. Yeah. I mean, obviously, as a commission, we've got a, a strategic interest in the relationship between the Accounts Commission and Audit Scotland. So, I mean, you talk about pulling apart. This is not a separation that we're talking about, is it? No, by no means. It's a clarification, really. But um, it's important, we think, and, and the government thinks, that our work is, is understood and acknowledged uh, and open to challenge as well. Uh, and at the moment, there are times when it's very hard to understand where Audit Scotland stops and the Commission begins, and that's the kind of thing we want to clarify a bit. Sorry, I mean, just one final almost process question. So this is the will of the, of the government minister responsible for local government, presume. So it, how does that work in the environment of the uh, uh, Audit Scotland board, for example? Does, does the minister sit on the board, or is there a directive issued to the board, or...? No, the minister Do you, are, you the, are you the missionary for the minister on that board, Mr. Well, no, White? not quite. I mean, although it's a very complex role, being a board member of the organisation whose job is to provide services to the Commission. Uh, and I think if we were drafting the legislation now, one might draft it slightly differently. But no, the minister doesn't sit on the board. The minister comes along more or less once a year to the Commission, and did that just the other week, to talk to us, to steer us. I mean, we, in the end, report to the minister... Um, but he is very clear that he does not wish himself to be involved in detail in our analysis of a particular local authority or the conclusions we reach or the work that we are expecting the local authority to do to remedy deficiencies in its performance. All of that he is very clear we should do independently. Um, but his steer remains 
you need to be more impactful than you've been, and that's what we take seriously. Okay. I, I mean, I'm going to ask the Auditor General if, or Alan Alexander if they want to come in, but, I mean, again, just for completeness, I mean, is that um, discussion that you've had with the Minister, is that a matter of public record? Is that minuted, for example? I don't think so, no. I mean, he, he spoke to me one-on-one -on -one when I was appointed. He's been along to the Commission a couple of times in the last year. Um, no, I don't think it's minuted as such, but it's, it's, I think he would acknowledge fairly openly that this is what he's telling us he would like to see. Okay, thanks. Can I just say, um, Chair, the, the, the statutory responsibility of what it's got uh, through its board is to provide services to the Auditor General and to the Accounts Commission. Um, the line that you're discussing, Mr Leonard, um, has been part of the consideration that the board has given, and particularly the independent members of the board have given to the construction of the budget. Uh, I think it's, there's, there's some of this is, as it were, one-off to, to um, fund the changes to which Bill has referred. Um, but in the construction of the budget, the amount of due diligence that's been given to it by the Audit Committee and by the board uh, is the same as it is across the entire budget. Uh, and I think that um, as so long as what the Accounts Commission wishes to do is within its statutory responsibilities, then our responsibility is to exercise due diligence uh, and at, at a board level on that, and that we've done. And this is the number that we've come up with uh, in this particular budget proposal. Okay. And again, and, and so just going back to my original question around the Comptroller of Audit Post, so that was in the um, housed inside Audit Scotland's budget. It's now going to be transferred to the Accounts Commission. So is there a, you know, you're, you're asking us for a net increase here, uh, co which, which has been part constituted by the additional cost of that salary. Is that not simply an internal transfer from a salary ascribed to Audit Scotland, which you will now in future, if this is passed, be ascribed to the Accounts Commission? Maybe pick that up, um, Mr. Lennon. I think it's quite as Bill says the, the the role of controller of audit has fluctuated as, as to where it's existed within Audit Scotland for the past 20 years. You know, prior to Audit Scotland's creation, the the controller of audit of the Accounts Commission, as was was a standalone post, and then it's it's varied uh, in times as to where it sat. In recent years, Bill quite rightly mentioned it's been alongside the responsibilities of the Director of Performance Audit and Best Value. But as Bill said today and, and also in, you know, since he took up post, for the Commission's ambition, the Accounts Commission's ambition to be more visible, more impactful, it's been their uh, position that they've settled on that the Controller of Audit becomes a standalone role um, to deliver their requirements. Audit Scotland exists at its most basic function to provide services to the Accounts Commission and the Auditor General. Um, parking for a moment the complexity of our governance arrangements with both Bill and I um, as board members of Audit Scotland. Um, so that has led us to the point today that so there's no separate budget per se for the Accounts Commission. The fact that so it's an Audit Scotland budget that is providing those services. But as what we look today in the budget proposal is to be transparent, because that represents quite a material change in how Audit Scotland will function and how it will provide those services to the Accounts Commission. Okay. Um, can I just move on to one other area that uh, we wanted to ask about? And that's um, the reference that's made in the proposal um, to uh, efficiency improvements. I think it's um, paragraph 19 on page 8. Um, the, the proposal talks about action has already been implemented to secure efficiency improvements in the delivery of audit work, particularly in relation to financial statement audits. Um, could you describe some of the features of those efficiency improvements um, and um, you know, how they've related to the fees charged to the bodies which have been audited? Um, yeah, I'm happy to start. I said I'll, I'll bring in Vicky um, and, and others um, uh, in a moment. At its most fundamental, we want to be efficient for all the work that we do. You know, we're continually looking for ways that we can improve both the quality, timeliness of our work. Timeliness of it is still impacted by the pandemic. You know, even today, approaching the end of December, we are still working on 
completion of 2021-22 audits uh, in advance of uh, some of the statutory deadlines, particularly for central government uh, bodies. Um, so there's an, an element of catch-up that we're still playing as an organisation, but also looking for analysis through our audit methodology that that is as efficient, yes, but also that it's that it's meeting the increasing bar of quality standards. Um, there are many changes, and, and I'll happily come back to uh, the Commission response to Mr Johnson's question about you know, the, the changes in standards. Um, not to go into too much detail, Mr Lennon, but one of the most significant that's coming uh, at the moment is a new auditing standard um, on uh, the use of IT audit. And that's having a really material impact on how we go about our audit work and our methodology. So we, we're applying that, we're absorbing it, um, but we're also saying, well, what does that mean for how we're going to be more efficient? We've spoken to the Commission in, in recent discussions with you about digital auditing as well, about how we are making better use of digital tools and techniques. Um, and it is that twin track thing that also it supports the quality of our work. They were getting to you know, the heart of some of the, the material transactions that public bodies are doing that have an audit interest, but also saying, well, can we do that more quickly, more efficiently, that results in um, faster audit reporting and potentially audit costs? I think at the moment we're not quite in the position that we say that we complete this methodology analysis. That's going to lead to an X percent reduction in audit costs. But we're really careful, and I think we, the, we do make reference in the budget proposal today um, that we want to make sure that you know, if that is having a material change, that we will reflect that in the audit fees that we charge, and similarly through uh, future budget proposals. If I may pause there, I'm sure Vicky wants to come in too. Yes, um, hopefully what we're doing is, is will reassure you. Um, what we don't want to do is just keep saying to clients or ourselves with the new standards, the new innovations that are coming on within um, the industry that we're just adding on, adding on. We are constantly reviewing our audit approach to make sure we are auditing on the right areas, having an appropriate risk base to our audit work. And, and you will know that we've um, developed our innovation and quality um, team to be looking at that. And that particularly, I think we're quite clear that the auditor of today is different from the auditor of five years ago, but I think the auditor of five years to come will be very different from the auditor today with all the innovations. We're wanting to work closely with the firms that we've procured services around to speak to them about the R&D and the investment that they have available to them to be building on um, to look at the way we do our audit. So, um, with our executive um, director for innovation and qualities working right across the organisation to make sure that we are not only just keeping up to date, but we are the forefront of how we're auditing. Otherwise, I think you know we could just come under pressure of just adding on, adding on, and that's not what innovation, um, particularly around the digital, is trying to do for us. So we're very active in this space, which I hope reassures you that when we're coming to you, we're looking at how we're being as efficient as possible and delivering our budget. And another example of that would be how we're auditing climate change um, for... Um, at the bodies as well and looking at how we weave that into the work we're doing um, again from a risk basis from what um, scrutiny um, requirements are rather, um, to be as efficient as possible so that work will always be ongoing um, but I think with the new director of innovation and quality we're putting quite a clear focus on that work. Okay, thanks. Just one final question as a follow-up to that I mean do you do anything to incentivize the audited bodies to help you um, uh, carry out a more efficient audit of their work? Um, so we, we, when we engage with uh, audited bodies, so we, we've spoken about audit fees and you know, we communicate on an annual basis um, through the, an annual audit plan goes to every audited body. Set, so here's how the audit's gonna work. You know, the, the responsibilities of the auditor, the expectations of the auditor, um, along with the anticipated timescales and so forth, and about how they'll address the risk. Within the plan, it states that there's a, a requirement to have to be prepared to all intents and purposes. Um, that's not always the case, and in those circumstances, um, something of a punitive measure is that you know because you know, otherwise 
Audit Scotland, effectively the public purse will be absorbing that inefficiency. There's a provision for the auditor to charge some additional fees uh, where, those, uh, where there have been those circumstances. What we, what we don't offer is to say, and if you are uh, very well prepared, that that will result in an X percent reduction in your audit fee, largely because of the fixed nature of, of our costs. Um, we, we don't operate with those variables. However, I think there is something to, you know, if we get to a more stable uh, environment after you know, the effects of the pandemic have washed through, applying some of the innovations and digital approaches, we'd be very happy to look at that, to think actually that there is some incentive model, but I think we're perhaps a couple of years away from being able to you know, enact such an approach. So still in the of sticks and not carrots. To a degree. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Could, could I bring Mark Ruskell in at this point? Yeah, Ms. Convener, um, so I wanted to ask you about the strategic improvement programme and the long-term estate strategy and how that aligns with the future operating model. And I think, Vicky, you alluded earlier on to a rates review uh, of, your, of your main premises. Um, we were fortunate enough to, to visit you in, in, in the summer, very nice offices. Um, but just thinking now about how that aligns now with that future operating strategy in terms of space and location and what you might be planning. <clears throat> I'll come in on it. Thank you. It's a very live issue, which, um, as you know, Audit Scotland is not alone to this. Probably every organisation in the world is looking at what are the impact of the way of working from COVID, how we realise the benefits of that going forward but also how we get back to what is an appropriate balance of either, I think for us, in office space, but also client facing um, space and what that balance is. And um, so we're very much active in looking at this about how individuals can do the work, but we're also conscious about how you collectively, as an organisation, as a team, do your, do your work. And 100% homeworking doesn't lend itself to that. Very conscious, talked about different pathways, thinking about graduates, thinking about modern apprenticeships, um, school leavers. How do they learn? Not just the technical learning of being an accountant or an auditor, but actually learn the wider skills. So these are really important to us that we're trying to balance at the moment. We're very aware we've touched on climate change and tackling other inequalities and the benefits of hybrid working around that. And then there's, I suppose, the financial impact of looking at where could we make savings on our um, estate strategy. We've got break-even points um, for um, our offices, 2025 for Edinburgh, um, 27 for our Glasgow office. So we are actively looking at options. We've been working um, with organisations to look at actually if coming into the office is more that collaborative space, what does that mean? So we maximise the benefits of people coming together. Um, we've been actively discussing this with the board and looking at our metrics that we've got around staff coming in, staff going to the office. We do think it's a wee bit early to rely on those metrics to completely think about what our future working model um, is, but this is going to be a key priority for us in 2023, thinking about what is the right balance of the gains that we can have from hybrid working, which will be a balance of people working at home. But hybrid is also people working together. Hybrid is not people working um, exclusively from home. So... Um, we also aware of the client facing about being audit, being out at clients, picking up those um, more nuanced parts of that engagement with the client. But also it requires the clients to be working out what their position is. There's no point in auditors all going out to the organisation, actually, if the client is, um, is mainly home based as well. So we've got to work that through. Um, so I was understanding how ways of working might change but to put it bluntly is there a case to look at smaller cheaper different locations yeah and we are outside Edinburgh I mean I, I don't know 
I think um, we are very much looking at that. As I say, we've got our lease break in 2025 and there's options for actively speaking um, with um, landlords about we have to do that with staff. It would be absolutely right we do that with staff. So the work that we are doing, we've very much got um, union representatives as part of that um, ongoing discussion. So it's balancing that. But we're very clear. There's clear financial savings to be made climate change, net zero positive impacts we can make around reducing our office capacity. But it has to be done not at the expense of how we deliver a high quality of audit. And that's the balance we're looking at. As well Absolutely. as customer satisfaction, client Could satisfaction. That, uh, Mr. Russell, I've said to, to the board on a number of occasions, this is one of these issues that it's more important to get it right than to get it soon. And I think there's, a, there's quite a lot of easy assumption about how the world of work has been changed by the pandemic. It sure as hell was, but we are in no position yet to say how permanent that is, and we have to make a, a very well-informed judgment on that before we can, as it were, harvest any efficiencies. But we're certainly very clear that there is the strong possibility over the medium term, the short to medium term, that we can uh, reduce our costs in terms of, uh, of the estate we occupy. It is, of course, made slightly um, more difficult by the fact that we don't own any, own any of it, you know, and therefore there will, be dis there will be negotiations and discussions both to wind down and to wind up, if that's the position that we get to. I, Mr. Oscar, I, I, I agree with everything uh, Vicky and Alan have said. I think one of the features we'll see over the next few years, really across all public sector bodies, is really close examination of their estate, you know, set out as one of the Scottish Government's public sector reform efficiency proposals in their resource spending review. We'll perhaps see more over the course of the next couple of days and more detail on that through the budget. But I think that affords us perhaps some opportunities about, you know, where we are using our estate, where we're based. So we've got you know, three, four sites across Scotland at the moment. I think we can fully expect to be, have a presence across the country. <coughs> But as we're tracking how really people's working practices evolve about whether that means we've got smaller microsites in, in different parts of Scotland engaging with other public bodies uh, to have that presence. So uh, if everything Alan and Vicky have said is right, is that we're tracking it, but we're not going to leap into any decision just given the, the amount of variables at the moment. And, um, and can I move on sort of neatly on, on to the, the impact of COVID then? Um, there's obviously been a, a delay in terms of um, auditing work. C can you give an assessment of where, we are, where you are as an organisation in terms of catching up from that? Um, and if I could also ask just about clarity in terms of COVID funding as well, that would be, that would be useful. Yeah, I'm going, I'm going to bring colleagues in actually. Perhaps start with um, Martin in terms of um, our delivery arrangements um, in terms of the both the, the financial audit and you may want to say a bit about the delivery of our audit programme and uh, Vicky can touch on about uh, the COVID funding. Um, before, I think as a headline, um, we're still feeling the effects of, of the pandemic in terms of delivery and I think it's, it's absolutely the case that public bodies are too. The, the, you know, I think as I mentioned in introductory remarks, although you know, the, the virus impacts in terms of public health has ebbed, it's still lingering really strongly in, in what it's meaning for public service delivery. Um, and in terms of our audit work, we are still in that place too. But I'll, I'll pass to Martin first. Uh, thank you. Um, so I suppose in terms of COVID, the, the, we've always looked at it from two dimensions. The first is what our audit response to the pandemic has been. Um, and then, of course, what our own organisational response has been. Um, so in terms of the audit response, uh, very early on um, in the pandemic, we actually set out our approach to what we were going to cover and what areas of focus might be um, around that. And uh, we uh, set up a COVID-19 hub. Um, and since the pandemic hit, we've actually put out 20 uh, specific publications on COVID. And of course, as you would expect, the impact of COVID on individual <coughs> audit organisations features were appropriate in those audit reports, as well as things like the NHS overview report and so on. So I think, um, you know, we've had a clear focus on that in terms of the, the audit perspective. In terms of the organisational impact, um, as with other organisations, um, it's been an evolving 
situation. Clearly, there was the uh, early stages of lockdown, the, the kind of shock and awe that hit everybody in, in society around that. We were able to transition very, very quickly, um, actually, because of the business continuity arrangements we got in place. Um, and that meant that the impact um, on us as an organisation was probably far less than it could have been had those arrangements not been in place, and indeed on many other um, organisations that, that we audit. Um, there's no doubt that the uh, pandemic continues to have an impact on the delivery of audit. Um, this year, uh, our objective was to return back to something much closer to pre-pandemic deadlines in terms of delivering the audits. Um, we do an okay on that, but we're not quite back to where we would like to be. So, for example, as at this morning, um, all of the health audits were completed to schedule. Um, local government audits were at 81% completion, 84% uh, completion in terms of central government audits. And, of course, for those, the, the deadline for those hasn't uh, arrived yet. That's the end of this month. So we're seeing some um, return, if you like, but probably not as much as we would like. What we're finding is that there is still lingering effects, both on us as an organisation, but indeed on the uh, bodies that we audit as well. So earlier on, Stephen was talking about, you know, the readiness of organisations, the readiness of the accounts and so on. And of course, we can't do the audit until those are in there. And um, the last thing I would say um, in terms of our organisational response um, is that we did very much throughout the pandemic prioritise the health, safety and wellbeing of our colleagues. Um, and I think that's borne fruit in terms of the amount of time lost and the amount of sickness that's been recorded to COVID um, because we did very deliberately took a very kind of people focused approach to that. Uh, we've invested very much in terms of communicating with colleagues right across the, the, the course of the pandemic and so on. Um, and the different engagements that we've had with people and some of the surveys that we've run tell us that people have really quite appreciated with that. Um, but I think we're not out of the woods yet. Um, I think one of the things that's impacted on the delivery deadlines for the audit um, was what we in-house refer to as the snowplow effect, um, in that the initial effect of the, uh, of, of the pandemic has kind of rolled through into subsequent years. So it takes longer to get the first year done, and that means a slightly slight later start to the second year. So you're sort of playing catch up in that year as well. And that's probably where we're at at the moment. We've not been able to fully catch up. Uh, but certainly, there's no doubt that people are working very hard to do so. Right. Okay. And on the COVID funding side, if I uh, may follow up. So this um, budget that's presented to you, and indeed with last year's budget, um, our position is it doesn't have any COVID funding in it. And if I may take a moment to explain that. Um, so in 2021, uh, we asked for an additional 1.5 million of funding um, to cover the loss of income from um, because of the timing of um, the audits due to um, COVID, um, which we received, and um, we've paid that back of underspend well up to the tune of 1.4 million of underspends in um, each year of 0.7 million in 21, 2021 and um, 21-22. Our budget last year did have, it was called contingency then of 2.4 million, um, which um, 0.4 million of that was for the pay award. Um, and um, 0.5 was, um, million was for contingency. So that left a 1.5 million um, amount of contingency. And I think picking up on Mr. Johnson's point of earlier, having numbers being the same can confuse what that 1.5 million was, was around building our capacity as an organisation. Um, and um, 1.2 million of that was for additional auditors. Um, we've recruited 24 additional auditors as a result of that. They're on permanent contracts. So it is a recurring cost. It's not one-off cost. 300,000 of that was around the new financial powers and the increased quality. And we've recruited a number of staff in relation to that. So I'd be very happy to follow up with that of the breakdown um, of what that 1.5 million is, but it is recurring costs. So um, I would um, like to clarify that we're not seeing that as one-off 1.5 million 
COVID funding. We paid that back. The additional funding was around ongoing building the capacity of what we feel the budget is needed to deliver on the um, the capacity, financial um, powers and quality that future audit requires. And that was what was in last year's budget, which we're rolling forward. That's baselined. We're not calling that contingency anymore. The only contingency we have in the budget is that 500,000, which we've spoken about. But if it helps to clarify, I'm, I'm very happy to put that, um, make that more explicit um, and a breakdown of what's been yeah. spent on that recurring basis. Thank you. Okay. Um, do any other members have any questions they would like to ask? I got one or two just to clear up at the end, but otherwise, if this time, um, yeah. Um, just briefly, I mean, one of the the the, the, the issues that uh, uh, flagged uh, reading through this was your uh, 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 plans on innovation, and that the that's at, the, the the budget proposal outlines a, a, a reduction. In capital requirement from 100, uh, no, from 250 in 2023 uh, to 150 in 23-24. Um, I'm just wondering, given the, the, the you know the increasing burdens and complexity, uh, you know, and indeed, you, you know, additional people you need, I might have expected you to be having an associated increase in capital systems, IT, you know, automation. To deal with that is just wondering what the explanation is for the, the reducing capital requirement. Yeah, it's very uh, important actually, as you quite rightly say. We have um, we're predominantly a people business, you know. So, but nonetheless, we do still require capital to support some of the delivery of our services. Um, I I don't think this reflects a pattern. What we think is going to be in, in future years, probably <clears throat> something of the, in previous years we've invested both in. Uh, you know, digital hardware, as Martin rightly mentioned, we did a lot of that at the early stages of the pandemic so that colleagues could work remotely. Um, and not for this year's budget, but for the you know, following year likely and, and the year after that, one of our next investments is going to be not so much our offices, but actually our uh, electronic working papers. And that's going, that would be, we're going through a, a scoping that programme at the moment. So I think it's going to be a feature of next year's budget. I suspect what this really reflects is something of a lull in that investment. And I've just got one final, and this is a bit, I'm afraid it's a bit of a cheeky question, if I'm being honest with you. Um, I couldn't help but note on page 22, uh, 22 uh, what looks awfully like a rate card to me. Um, and, and just looking at, at those and looking at your, your, your people that you are charging out, can I just ask, um, you know, what, what's your sort of target number of chargeable hours per year um, for, for a, a, a chargeable person for a whole time equivalent? Um, Which I, I, I know when you're constructing this will be, if it's not expressed like that, will be at the forefront of your mind when you're constructing rate card. So really, I think what, what the terminology we would use is utilisation rates sure. within the organisation. That varies by grade. <laughs> so... Um, Trainees have a lower utilisation rate because we're investing in their learning and development through their uh, professional qualifications. It tends to go on a bit of a bell-shaped curve. So for our, our newly qualified roles, senior auditor have, tend to have the highest utilisation, and that then falls as colleagues become more involved in um, engagement, corporate activities as they progress to uh, more senior grades in the organisation. Um, what, what I don't have at my fingertips is the, the, the precision around that as to kind of what that means, but it largely... It's, we've, we use that information carefully and we track it carefully about the productivity of colleagues as well uh, in individual grades. All of that you know, informs both our, our management information about how we are supporting colleagues and then the delivery of audits and it's also useful information about our cost base as well. Um, again, I'm, I'm happy to come back to the, the Commission in more detail in writing, just to kind of set that out for you. Very helpful. Certainly from a previous life, 80% I, I mean, utilisation rate, you know, between 60 and 80%, you know, you know, it would be useful to know whether or not that sort of, you know, what parameters you're using. Um, um, but it'd be interesting to, to know that. Uh, I've just got a couple of questions myself, just to probably wind up a bit. On page 9... Uh, paragraph uh, 31, you talk about specific areas of our administrative budget have no inflation applied, 
Which areas are these? I'm going to turn to Stuart uh, Chair if you have that detail because I, I understand the nature of the question given the uh, cost of living and the, the challenges uh, that we're experiencing. Uh, if we have that information, we can share it with you. If not, we'll come back. Stuart. Yeah, I mean, um, looking at the Appendix 1, there are uh, summarised into there, we will have areas like um, staff recruitment, um, things like internal audit, external audit. You'll see that they actually remain static. Um, things on um, IT as well is not a huge increase um, in that area. Um, so there are numerous um, areas where, where we haven't applied uh, uh, any inflation at all, and we're just looking at that as a as a savings. Drawing our attention to Appendix One, I'm looking at legal and professional fees. They seem to have gone up substantially, from 840 to 752, and that is yeah, but they went up to 840 from 600 odd. Yeah, that's for the National Fraud Initiative. Of, oh. well, what we have to contribute 220,000, and that's every two years. So <laughs> next year we don't have that, but it will be in a requirement in 24-25. Look, it's just one final question. Uh, you, you've touched on uh, hybrid models and so on of working, and I know that from past uh, discussions that uh, this is very active. But the overall delivery model, is that under consideration at all? You know, what, what, what costs and benefits are there for providing the audit work, for example, by in-house teams versus uh, outside? Are you, are, you, are you looking at the whole <coughs> possibilities here in terms of uh, how to deliver the services? We, <clears throat> Chair, we, we have given that uh, really is on the back of a two-year project that led to the culmination of the <clears throat> development of both of the Code of Audit Practice and the procurement of audit services um, was central to that thinking about the delivery model that exists for the delivery of, of public audit services in the provision of in-house teams and those of firms. The Council Commission, the Auditor General, both myself and predecessor and the Audit Scotland Board weighed up the cost benefit of that and came to the position that operating a mixed market in Scotland gave us the, the best balance of um, efficiency, access to expertise and predictability in the delivery of services. Um, there, are other, there are other models that exist. Um, I, th I think we are unique though in having an Auditor General and an Accounts Commission and and uh, uh, a public audit agency. Uh, but the extent to which private firms are used varies elsewhere in the UK. And also, as does the um, certification model that exists. The, there is, you know, in the, the National Audit Office, for example, it's still largely the case that the Comptroller and Auditor General certifies all of the um, audits uh, that they undertake. Whereas in Scotland, we appoint auditors in their own name to certify um, the delivery of, of public audits. We're keeping it under close review, but I think where we are at now is that we have a code of audit practice plus a procurement arrangements in place for the next five years. It doesn't allow for the fact that you know, if there's a market shock, as you know, we experienced in the best part of 20 years ago, that one of the providers decided to pull out of the market. But I don't think we're in those circumstances. And I think it's something that, um, although it feels like a number of years away, we're already beginning to think about how we'll undertake the next um, delivery of the code and, and procurement. And that's and closely monitoring both the quality and value for money remains central to our thinking. OK. Do any members have any other question that would like to ask at this point? In that case, since no other members uh, indicated they've got any more questions, I'll conclude the evidence-taking session uh, by thanking everybody, for the witnesses in particular, for attending today. And that concludes the public part of the meeting. And uh, I don't know if members want a couple of minutes uh, comfort break before we
crack on with the the private session. But uh, just just so I don't forget, I'll wish all the witnesses a very happy Christmas and a, a great New Year. All the best.